It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome to our everydayers. You know who you are, those of you who never miss a single show. I appreciate you being here very much. Also, please be sure to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Have you ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your football franchise? Then this game is definitely for you. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. Our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code LOCKEDON in the game. Well, folks, we're going to do another episode of Herd Mentality this week for a couple of reasons. First of all, the questions have been coming in. We got a lot of great stuff to get to. It was filling up, and I wanted to address some of these really good questions that you guys have been sending in. But also next week is our last full week before the 2023 NFL Draft, and there are several positional previews that I want to get to, including wide receiver, edge rusher, tight end, There's some interior offensive linemen I want to talk about. There's at least one running back that I want to talk about, maybe some safeties. And so I want to give myself a big opportunity to get all of that in next week and get next week's episode of Herd Mentality in today. So let's get started. So many great things to get to. First one comes from Wayne. Wayne says, what would the Bills have to do in a trade to acquire both Mozzie Smith, who is a defensive tackle from Michigan, and Jack Campbell, the linebacker from Iowa. Would you draft Mozzie at 27 and offer our third this year and next to move up from 59 for Campbell? Would that get us high enough? I like this question because it gives us an opportunity to talk about some trade scenarios. And in the next question, we're going to talk a little bit about trading up. But for this one, I'm actually going to talk about trading down in the first round for the Buffalo Bills. And I think the best way to do something like this might be to move back and then up, all right? I think there's a possibility that the Bills could trade out of the first round. In fact, it might not be a bad idea. But in order to do that, you need to have a partner. You have to have a team willing to move back into the first round. And and that partner has to be picking somewhere that it makes sense for you to move. Like maybe you don't want to move from 27 to like 58, right? You want to move maybe a... 10 or so spots back. And I think that the perfect trade partner for the Buffalo Bills is the Las Vegas Raiders, who enter this draft with 12 selections. And I'm not going to read them all, but some of the picks that I think it's worth mentioning is they own picks 7, 38, that's a good one, 100, 109, 141, and 144. And the Raiders, I don't think they're going to pick a quarterback at 7, but they could be thinking about moving back into the first round for a quarterback. And obviously they signed Jimmy Garoppolo to a very modest contract that really doesn't commit to him long-term. And they've met with all five of the perceived first round quarterbacks and Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Will Levis, Anthony Richardson, and Hendon Hooker. If they like one of them and that player still there at 27, would the Bills like to move back to 38? and pick up pick 70 and 109. I think that's a conversation worth having. And I think if you do that, I think you're going to position yourselves to come away with both a linebacker and a defensive tackle. So maybe a move back to 38 and you pick Mozzie Smith or Brian Breezy. If you want to go defensive tackle and then you look at pick 59 and you say, well, maybe want to move up and make sure we get Jack Campbell. I think that's a possibility that we should be talking about. And so I'm glad this question was asked 
And that way I can kind of get into some of the, uh, the logistics behind that potential move. Now, this next question from Cameron is about trading up in the first round. So let's get into that a little bit here. Cameron says, I am wondering if you might be able to comment on recent reports of Brandon Bean exploring options for trade for trade upwards in the draft. Could it be that he is wanting to try and grab a wide receiver who could replace Gabriel Davis, or could he be gearing up for a run at a linebacker or perhaps running back B. John Robinson? I just wondered what it means to you if Bean is trying to get upwards in the draft. Who is it that he wants? All right, so this report came from Matt Miller of ESPN and said that Brandon Bean is wanting to move up potentially and had his eyes on an interior offensive lineman or an offensive weapon. Some thoughts on that. First of all, does anything ever really leak out of one Bill's drive with Brandon Bean as the GM? I don't think so. And so I have some questions about the validity of this because I don't feel like something like that would really get out. But also, I'll say this, trading up in the first round is in line with Brandon Bean's behaviors. He's done it three different times. He traded up for Josh Allen. He traded up for Tremaine Edmonds. And last year, he traded up for Kyer Elam. Now, he sticked and picked at number nine for Ed Oliver and then the Greg Rousseau pick, he also sticked and picked there. So three times he moved up and twice he stayed put. He's never moved back in the first round. So for as enticing as that could be, as I just outlined in the last answer, we don't really have data or a case study that says he will do that. Now, one thing that I've learned about Brandon Bean and, and studying him very closely over the last however long he's been the GM is that his behaviors, while you think you might have an idea of what he likes to do, he's shown adaptability, right? He's evolved a lot. The core philosophies that maybe you've thought he had at one point are different because of where the team is during their life cycle. And so I, I'm mindful of that, and that's why I'm not going to dismiss the idea that he could move back. And I think there's a Strong conversation to be had about that being the right thing to do based on who's on the board. But if he moved up, I would think it's for Jackson Smith and Jigba, who just feels like a perfect receiver for this offense. Maybe it's for Bijan Robinson. I have some level of doubt that Brandon Bean would move up for a running back. I certainly don't think he's moving up for an interior offensive lineman. Not after he just got done paying Morse, Bates, and McGovern contracts over the last like in the last calendar year all of those guys have received deals from the bills to be starters so i'd be surprised if that were the case so i guess to tie a ribbon on my answer here i question the validity of the report because one bill's drive is very tight-lipped and there's really not leaks if the bills did move up i would think it would be for jackson smith and jigba but I think the better conversation is moving back, although Brandon Bean has never done that in the first round. Maybe this talent pool, this scenario of where he's picking, where the team is in their life cycle, maybe that does make sense this time around. Next one comes from Chris, who says, I enjoyed your assessment of the top-tier linebackers. After listening, I checked out both Campbell and Drew Sanders. I prefer Sanders, but not as a Edmonds replacement but as a Lorenzo Alexander replacement. Maybe a three-safety strategy makes up for coverage we would get from our middle linebacker position and allow the Bills to make this pick. Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I prefer Campbell, and because I think Campbell is a more true Mike linebacker, and as I've said with Drew Sanders out of Arkansas, if you really want to maximize what he does, you got to let him rush. And I can completely understand and would agree with you that if you drafted Drew Sanders – he would be utilized more in that Lorenzo Alexander role. However, I haven't seen the Bills really embrace that type of utilization since Lorenzo Alexander, and it doesn't fix the hole that you have at Mike Linebacker. And so if you do draft Drew Sanders, I hope that you do allow him to rush and, and take advantage of that because I think that's probably his best ability but his downhill ability, his take on ability, his coverage skills feel very underdeveloped to me. 
And I don't think he's the type of guy that you can draft and he's going to hit the ground running right away with what you need from a Tremaine Edmonds replacement. So I hear you, but I'm trying to replace Tremaine Edmonds. I'm not trying to replace Lorenzo Alexander. So I agree, but I also disagree, if that makes sense. I agree that Drew Sanders would be the Lorenzo Alexander replacement, but we're in a different world now. We need a Tremaine Edmonds replacement, and I don't feel super comfortable about that being a, a swift transition. All right, we got a bunch more to get to here in just a moment, but first I need to tell you about Ultimate Football GM, the sponsor of today's episode. You've heard me talk about this mobile game app, and if you think you'd make a good NFL GM, well, you got to give this a try. When you play Ultimate Football GM, you get to control and manage every strategic aspect of your team as you try to build a dynasty. With Ultimate Football GM, you're responsible for hiring coaches and coordinators, managing the finances of your team, including negotiating player salaries and terms, you got to deal with the draft, free agency, injuries, player issues, personnel issues, all the ups and downs of a season, all in a realistic game world. Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline, on the go, as you want, and when you want to. Locked on Bills listeners, you get a 100% free boost to your franchise when using promo code Locked On in the game store. That's Locked On, so make sure to check it out today. To download the game again, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. That's ultimate-gm.com. Ultimate Football GM, start your dynasty today. The next one today comes from Joseph, who says, I've been wondering about a tight end with the Bills' first pick, ideally after a trade back. And with news of the Darnell Washington visit, I thought it was worth a conversation. I see the hole at linebacker and the empty pipeline of defensive talent, or excuse me, defensive tackle talent versus the low relative value of a tight end too. It makes a high pick tough to justify. However, considering two dominant factors among Bills fans are protect Josh Allen and give Josh weapons, do you think he could move the needle on both fronts in year one and beyond? It's a really fun question. And Darnell Washington's a football player that I really like. I'm super intrigued by him. Almost six foot seven, 265 pounds, tons of length, really good blocker, and a talented pass catcher. Very savvy. He blocks like you want him to for 265 pounds. Right? He's going to make you more physical up front. I think about him doing the things that the Bills have asked Gabe Davis to do, and I get a lot more excited about that. I think he's going to be a real asset in blocking, whether that's run blocking or pass protection. But I love the size and athleticism as well as a pass catcher where you know, he can certainly challenge the seam with his size and athleticism, but he's also very smart, very good at settling into zones, reading coverage, knowing where to, to settle in and make himself available, and obviously he's a massive target. I, I, I love the idea of adding Darnell Washington. I think I get hung up on some of the stuff that you do where it's like, all right, well, you got a huge hole at linebacker. You got an empty pipeline of defensive tackle talent. And how are you really going to maximize an investment like, you know, late first round pick, even if you do were to trade back and pick them early in the second round, where's, where's your real impact going to be? Are you going to really embrace more 12 personnel to maximize this? I mean, the Bills haven't shown much of a appetite, or Josh Allen hasn't shown that big of an appetite to throw the football to tight ends, right? He's wanting to throw the ball to wide receivers. The Bills struggle to get Dawson Knox going at a rate that makes us feel good about $14 million a season, much less uh, an early draft pick. And you know, what's this guy going to catch, 15, 20, 25 passes? Are people going to be satisfied with that, knowing that he's going to play 35% of the snaps, block on most of them, and catch – 15 to 25 passes. It's intriguing to me. And if the bills would really embrace it and utilize him, I think there's a lot of value here. And that's why this is intriguing to me, but I, I feel myself personally wanting more of that third or fourth round tight end, like a Luke Schoonmaker from Michigan to come in and be the discount version of Darnell Washington maybe achieve some of the same objectives, but without the higher investment in terms of draft capital. So I, I like the idea. 
I just worry about how it actually comes together in a meaningful way that's going to make us say, yeah, you know what? That was the right thing to do with that pick. But I love Darnell Washington and what he would bring to any team, of course, including the Buffalo Bills. Owen says, I'm sure you'll get to the top 30 visits. Yes, we will definitely do that next week. But do you read anything into not having any linebackers in as far as we know? From what I can tell, they met with Trenton Simpson at the Combine, but apart from that, zilch. If you're thinking you want to draft a Mike, especially in the first round, who's going to be the quarterback of your defense, you'd want him in for a visit, right? Yeah, Owen, I think this is a good point. I think it's a really good point. And one thing that I've already acknowledged and I'm continuing to be willing to acknowledge is that for as much as I am nervous about Mike Linebacker, and I would love to see them add the players I've talked about, the Bills might not agree. They just might not, right? They might say, look, we anticipated this. We picked Terrell Bernard last year in the third round, and we're gearing up for him to be our guy next to Matt Milano. Like, that's definitely possible. And I'm willing to acknowledge that. And certainly not having any of these guys in for visits that we know of is a good indicator that that's probably true. And so for as much as I'm in on the Jack Campbell conversation, I also recognize that there's a possibility that it won't come to fruition. And like I mentioned last week, or maybe it was even this week, draft draft success for the Buffalo Bills in 2023 isn't married to getting Jack Campbell or any one player at all. And so this is a, a really worthwhile thing to bring up, and I'm certainly willing to acknowledge the possibility of the Bills not really having the same level of concern or even panic that we do, or at least I do, about this linebacker situation. Jeremy says, I've listened to all your podcasts regarding, uh, excuse me, I've listened to all your podcasts regarding Taylor Rapp, but I'm not sure if you've ever answered this question directly. Do you think Bean targeted him specifically so that they can run th more three safety sets or that they just felt like the player, that, did they just really liked the player and were surprised to get him at such a low cost? To me, if we lost Poyer, Rapp was the number one guy I wanted to replace him with. I don't know how you keep him off the field. Jeremy, I think Brandon Bean accomplished a lot of different things with signing Taylor Rapp. First of all, low-cost, good player. I never imagined he was going to be a one-year, $1.7 million deal. But that's what the Bills got him for. And so, first of all, you got a great depth piece behind Poyer and Hyde that gives you the opportunity to run three safety sets, but it also gives you a showcase opportunity. Because that starting job's not there for him right now, but it could be soon. Micah Hyde, an expiring contract. Jordan Poyer's two-year deal could very quickly become a one-year deal. And so you have a year now with Taylor Rapp to see what this guy is. And maybe you like what you see, and now you've had a, a unique opportunity to get to know the player before you commit more to him. And by more, I mean both a longer contract, but also a big role. So I think Brandon being accomplished a lot here. and. Sean McDermott said, yeah, we, we thought about Taylor Rapp as a player that we could sign to replace Jordan Poyer if he wasn't able to come back. And now they got him for a minimum deal. So pretty impressive, but I think he actually accomplished a lot. I'd love to see more three safety sets. I'd love to see more scheme versatility on defense with personnel groupings. And Taylor Rapp is the type of player that, to me, gives them a chance to do some of that. Next one here comes from Andrew, who says, Feels like everyone thinks Micah Hyde will be back and be 100% the same player he was. I'm not so confident in that. With the leadership of Edmonds gone, it makes us rely even more on that safety tandem. And if one goes down, we're taking we're talking first-year safety uh, Christian Benford or potentially returning to football Hamlet. Seems thin and nobody is talking about it. I know you mentioned you like Brandon Hill. I like Sidney Brown, but it's hard looking at tape of these guys because I'm looking – more for a pull, because I don't know if I'm looking for more of a pull replacement or a hide replacement. Well, first of all, Andrew, Taylor Rapp, let's not forget about him. He's part of the mix. So I think that's a really good hedge against uh, Micah Hyde not coming back and being the player we remember him being. I think the Bills' safety depth is not bad. I mean, they, they have three really good players, and then you, you, pr you typically roster four. And so whether that's Cam Lewis or Zane Anderson or DeMar Hamlin, who's 
gotten some experience now in the NFL, if he's able to come back and all those types of things, obviously. But I think the Bills are in pretty good shape at safety. And maybe they'll draft one. Sidney Brown's a player I like as well. I think he's a third or a fourth round pick out of Illinois. Brandon Hill, maybe a day three player that you can groom, should provide immediate special teams ability. So I, I don't know that I have the same level of concern here. And I think I think maybe you've overlooked Taylor Rapp here when this question was sent in. All right, folks, we got a bunch more to get to here after a quick break, including some conversation about different defensive tackle techniques and a couple of off-the-wall questions that I can't wait to get to here in just a moment. The next one today comes from Justin, and Justin says, do you care much for the drama-type stuff that goes on? You seem to rarely talk about that stuff outside of contextual references. Is it just to keep the podcast focused on stuff we love, or do you like slash hate or are indifferent to the rumor gossip aspect that some enjoy alongside the game? I appreciate this question, Justin, and I think you make a very astute observation. I stay away from a lot of that stuff. I really do. Partly because it's, quite frankly, sometimes uncomfortable for me to discuss. I know football, right? I know the game of football. I know the NFL, the league in general, college football, scouting, like team building. That's what I know. I don't know how to interpret cryptic wide receiver tweets. I just don't have anything to say about it. And I, I, I personally find it to be more annoying than anything. And because I don't really know how to like break it down and what it means. And I don't really like guessing I do stay away from it. So that's, that's a pretty good observation there, Justin. But I also appreciate that you mentioned that I do weave it in with, with contextual references. Like when it makes sense for me to mention these things, I, I do, but I don't get up in the, get caught up in the, all the what ifs and galaxy brain type stuff as it relates to some of that drama related components of football, right? It's, it is part of it. I, I recognize that. I do recognize that, but until it's, it means something and I can lace it together with some other analysis, I just, I don't have a high degree of comfort getting into it. I don't know what I could really offer. I think that's what the way I look at it. Like, what can I offer about some of this stuff? And I don't know that I have much to offer. So I typically stay away and keep the main thing the main thing. And when I have to talk about that stuff, I talk about that stuff. But Justin, you're not wrong. You make a good observation. And, you know, if I'm asked about stuff, a lot of times that, you know, if it's starting to pile up and people really want my perspective, I'll try. I'll give it my best. But it's just not where I feel like I excel as an analyst. And so I only weave it in when it makes sense to me. So I appreciate that question. I think that's a good one. The next one comes from Sean, who says, can you explain the skill and body type difference of a one tech versus a three tech in our four, three defense? This stems from a Buffalo rumblings article with Byron young as a selection and referencing. He has a skill set of a one tech, but the body of a three tech. This reminds me of some interior defensive line concerns regarding Ed Oliver having to play more of the one as opposed to the three tech. And that being a reason why he wasn't performing as well as he could. So basically in the Bills, even front defense, so four down linemen, you have typically a one technique and a three technique. The one technique lines up as a shade, <clears throat> excuse me, a shade over the center, and the three tech lines up on the outside shoulder of the guard on the other side. And the three technique is more of a athletic penetration style player, somebody that you want to shoot gaps get into the backfield, and use athleticism and play a little bit more free. Your one tech is usually a bigger-bodied player that is more of a space eater, a plug, an anchor against the run, a guy that can really control that middle, keep the second level clean, occupy space. They're not necessarily required to be as much of a dynamic penetration-style player. So both defensive tackles, but they're – they typically are different body types because your one techs are your bigger body guys that are really going to anchor and play the run where your three tech is more of a guy that you want to be explosive, get off the football and get into the backfield. 
And so because of that, the body types are different and with their roles being different, their skill sets that are required for each position are different, right? I mean, Ed Oliver is a very different player than Daquan Jones. Daquan Jones, your one tech, Ed Oliver, your three tech. You love interchangeability. You love guys that can play both. It's kind of rare, right? You don't see a ton of that. Um, so hopefully that was helpful in answering this question. And anytime you guys see this type of stuff that I can help explain that gives you a better understanding of the team roles, skill sets, any of that, I really do welcome them. And I get a lot of good feedback anytime we get into these types of things. So if I say something that doesn't make sense to you, you want further explanation on something that's a technical football thing, reach out. I'll be glad to address it. Uh, next one here comes from J.O. who says, here's an off-the-wall question. With the push towards on-purpose special teams players like Tyler Medikavich and Taiwan Jones, has any team tried to get a field goal blocking specialist on the roster? Maybe someone greater than seven feet tall with an eight-foot wingspan like Minute Bull, but with more bulk. Would such a thing matter, or would they move the kicking spot further back perhaps throwing off the timing of the snapper and holder. If it worked, one roster spot doesn't seem too steep a price to keep points off the board. I've never seen this. Now, you got some tall dudes in the NFL that play on the field goal block team that you know their, their job is to influence this type of stuff, like Greg Rousseau for the Bills or A.J. Epinesa, tall, long dudes. You put them in the middle there, and kicker knows they got to get it up over these guys. But I mean, you're talking about rostering somebody who's seven feet tall, the challenge here is they serve literally no other purpose. They're not going to play any other position for you. The only thing that they're going to do is try to block field goals. And at least with Tyler Medikavich or Taiwan Jones, they play four phases of special teams. I mean, you're talking about literally just the field goal block team. So I understand like the intrigue and in what you're mentioning, like they could potentially keep points off the board, really impact kickers but you only get to play with 48 guys on Sundays and using one guy to do this really stresses your roster and literally can't help you in any other capacity. So I, I don't know if the, I don't know if the, the value here makes sense to me. I think you just use your taller players for that type of role. Like teams have typically. But an interesting question and an interesting idea. If you had bigger rosters, I could understand it, but that's pretty hefty for a very, very specialized role. But I I see how it can make an impact. I mean, like, it'd be cool to see, like, if any team has ever done this and what the numbers are. Like, did they actually block kicks? Was the field goal percentage drastically different against them than another team? Like, a college team should do this, right? Got unlimited roster spots. Get some guy off the basketball team that's seven feet tall to stand there and try to make it hard for field goal kickers to make kicks. I don't know. It's interesting, but I don't think it'll happen in the NFL, but I do appreciate the question. All right, folks, that's it for today on the podcast and this week on the podcast. Like I always say, we're going into the weekend. If some big breaking news happens, we'll get together for a conversation as quickly as I possibly can. But other than that, we're going to get back together on Monday. Really looking forward to getting into the wide receivers, the edge rushers next week. We're going to talk tight ends as well. And, and like I said, we're going to get through the top 30 visits and fill in the blanks with all the other stuff that we haven't gotten to because that NFL draft is very, very soon. Like I said, next week is our last full week uh, before the 2023 NFL draft kicks off. So a busy couple weeks here coming up. Make sure that you are subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again on Monday.